Welcome everyone. This week we're happy to have Ian from Yale to tell us about what happens when conformal colliders meet the LHC. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. Um, so today I'm going to be telling you about some work I've done with a number of collaborators over the past couple of years in trying to make a bridge between some quasi-formal um, theory work, which goes under the name of conformal collider physics, and um, real-world colliders such as the LHC. And so I should say in advance that this is something that's kind of very much in progress. So particularly from the more formal side, the aspects that we're still using of these conformal collider physics are kind of relatively simple, but hopefully I'll convince you that it's kind of a nice um, direction, which allows one to um, genuinely learn more about LHC physics. And there's also lots of room for improvement and from, uh, for more nice techniques uh, from the theory side. And so I should also say that during the talk, I'm not going to go too much into the kind of details of the more, either the more formal aspects or the more phenomenological aspects. And so I'll just kind of give an overview of how these two are kind of um, mingling. And please feel free to ask me if you, there's more kind of detailed questions about either um, side of it. Um, okay, so just to kind of get things um, started with a very basic um, picture that everyone should be familiar with. So when you collide, for example, protons at the LHC, you get all these very nice um, sprays of um, collimated sprays of particles, which are called jets. And so the kind of classic way of thinking about them, which is also just the simplest, both from a kind of theoretical perspective and from a kind of data analysis perspective, is to kind of cluster them into some kind of cones, which are called jets, which have some particular directions and energies. And so what you're kind of doing from the theoretical perspective is projecting in some infrared and collinear safe way down onto some underlying um, scattering matrix element, which is supposed to be producing these quarks or gluons at some particular angles um, and directions. And so when you kind of do this projection down on these jets, what you're really getting out is the kind of kinematics of the underlying um, scattering amplitude. Um, and so this is something which um, kind of obtaining these very complicated amplitudes calculations has been a big driver of theory developments um, including kind of developing new ways of um, thinking about them and very sophisticated uh, mathematical techniques. And so this has really driven a lot of theory developments in um, quantum field theory. And it's useful at the LHC for kind of two reasons. One is it enables precision tests of QCD. So you can measure these very complicated multi-jet cross-sections. So it doesn't really matter what these all are, but they're just a whole bunch of very complicated amplitude calculations. And so these test very detailed aspects of the interactions of the standard model um, to very high precision. And they also enable kind of searches for uh, new physics, which could appear as some, for example, bump or resonance in this underlying uh, hard scattering matrix element. Um, but if we return to this kind of big picture of this collider, there's obviously a lot more information uh, which goes on in this collider. And so what's being analyzed so far is really just kind of a, a, both from a data science perspective and from a kind of field theory perspective is in some sense the most basic question. And so instead of looking at just the original kinematics of these different um, jets, which come out of the amplitude, one can take a particular jet and look at the kind of energy pattern which is deposited on the detector. And so one should think of this in kind of analogy with the CMB, that you have some kind of hard process happening at very early um, time scales, and then it kind of imprints itself on your detector um, at infinity. And so instead of just looking at the kind of angles and energies of these, one can start to look at actual correlations um, in the pattern of energy flux, which is observed in infinity. And so, for example, you could ask some question, like, just like you do in the CMB, like, what are the structures of um, three-point correlation functions, um, for instance? And so, though I won't talk about it that much in this talk, I'll mostly focus on how one can do these calculations and the theoretical aspects of it. I should say that the, one of the reasons why this kind of really got um, a lot of um, interest is that this is actually a very powerful way of searching for new physics at the LHC. So let's say you produce some new particle. It really doesn't matter what it is. In this case, I've just labeled it as some um, Z prime. And it decays just into kind of hadrons which go into your detector. And so if you don't, um, if the only, if it's just decaying into hadrons, the only thing that this experimentalist can kind of see is some slight distortion in the patterns of energy flux at infinity. And so if you're able to kind of decode that, it gives you many new ways of searching for kind of more subtle hints of new physics, exactly like one does in the um, CMB. 
And so it kind of opens the door to a lot more um, sophisticated searches than just, for example, bump hunts in like Lepton or something. And so this kind of really attracted a lot of um, people's attention and reinvigorated the study of jets and the energy flux inside jets as a tool ultimately for um, studying, searching for new physics, but also as a kind of interesting um, object to study in its own right. Um, and so just to make this kind of very clear, so this kind of, in some sense, changes the problem of the people in collider physics have been studying for a while from studying S matrix elements, which are really describing the kind of hard interaction. And so that's just kind of these S matrix elements with kind of fixed numbers. In this case, for example, um, six gluons coming out to trying to study the statistical properties of energy flux um, at infinity. And so, of course, if you really produced, for example, in this case, like a billion gluon um, S matrix element, you could just directly compute the energy flux distributions from the S matrix elements. But what we would like is some kind of way of directly talking about the energy flux at infinity and kind of doing this in a purely statistical kind of sense, which it doesn't require going through these um, internal S matrix um, elements. And so very concretely, what you can think about is if you're some experiment, you really just have experimentalist, you really just observe these kind of particles being detected in your detector, which you can unroll onto a plane. And then what you get are some, if you remove the kind of, whether or not they're a pion or whatever, you just get some kind of energy depositions. And this is almost kind of like some 2D um, field theory that you can imagine studying correlation functions on and understanding if you can directly understand these correlation functions without talking about the kind of S matrix um, elements. Um, and so one of the reasons why there's been this kind of nice um, interplay between some developments in um, conformal field theory and um, jet physics was it was kind of re-brought to attention, even though it existed earlier, by um, Hoffman and Malacena. And so they showed that one could give a very nice um, field theory definition of essentially a calorimeter cell. And so depending if you're more on the kind of phenomenology side, one can view it literally as like a detector cell in some particular direction, or you can view it in this kind of Penrose diagram to emphasize that it's kind of got this integral over time. So it's some um, non-local um, line operator. And so the way one can think about this is you can imagine having some, so you just take your stress energy tensor, you want to detect essentially the energy going in some particular direction. And so you're going to integrate over all time as the kind of detect or the collisions just go and they're coming through your detector and you're averaging over them. And then you move it off to infinity in the particular um, direction. And so this should really just be thought of as a kind of field theory definition of a calorimeter cell. And so then from the perspective of quantum field theory, what you're actually doing in jet substructure is studying the properties of correlation functions of multiple of these um, energy uh, correlate energy flux operators or ANEC operators or light ray operators, they have a bunch of different names, and you're studying them in some state uh, produced by the LHC or whatever other plot you have. And so one of the reasons why this is very nice is it gives a kind of very concrete um, field theoretic definition of what you're actually trying to do in jet substructure. And then you can apply kind of more sophisticated techniques to study uh, these particular objects here, which is what we'll do in the kind of rest of this talk. And so just because these might be a little bit unfamiliar with the people, so these energy correlators are kind of interesting because they take kind of an intermediate position between amplitudes and correlation functions. So for collider physics people, the reason we like amplitudes is obviously because they have kind of asymptotic states going off into your detector. But this also introduces infrared divergencies. And so this is why one has to do these complicated projections, for example, of jets and clustering them down onto the underlying uh, matrix element which then for measuring the actual um, experimental uh, cross-section makes them kind of theoretically very difficult to work with because you have to have some kind of actual algorithm which does this. On the other hand, kind of people more in, let's say, condensed matter or in um, conformal field theory, like correlation functions of local operators. And so these are less desirable from the um, collider physics perspective because they don't have asymptotic states, but they're kind of IR finite or non-perturbably well-defined or whatever you want to um, call it. Whereas these energy correlators kind of take the best of both worlds. So they're an actual IR finite or non perturbably well-defined observable, but they involve asymptotic states. And so they're really actually uh, kind of field theoretic, um, exactly what you want to talk about. Um, in asymptotic states are you talking about? Or, the, or so they involve energy flux and infinity. So one doesn't, yeah, I should phrase it more carefully. One doesn't need to have asymptotic states. 
which is also why they can make a connection to CFTs, but just that they involve energy they, flux and observables. There are observables at infinity, yeah. is a better way of saying it. Yes, absolutely. And so this is one of the things that also allows one to um, bridge with CFTs if they're well-defined in a CFT or if you actually have asymptotic states. Um, but there are observables placed at infinity, which is just what a collider wants. Um, but as compared to their kind of amplitude or correlation function um, counterparts, they're kind of much less in general well explored. So obviously the people here that have explored them, but as a general statement, they're um, much less well explored. Um, but that's starting to be changed in the last little bit, which I think is a really neat opportunity for um, to kind of rethink how some real world collider physics is actually done. Um, so in the, I mean, in the study of light ray operators, there you could also smear a current, not just T. Yeah. Is yeah. that interesting from the point of view of phenomenology? Like Maybe it some is some approximately conserved flavor current or something like that. It is definitely interesting. So one of the problems, like let's say you just take like charge, then it's not or like electromagnetic charge. Um, then it's not often they're not um, um, infrared finite if computed just in or they're not infrared finite often if they're not energy weighted. Um, um, and so I think one. Okay. Um, and so that what that means is they're very sensitive to like the details of the hadronization process. So it's not that they're not interesting, they're just very hard to compute in QCD. Um, um, so, so I think, and it means that they're very sensitive to the hadronization process. So one thing which I won't kind of show here, but I think is a little bit more along the lines, or one thing, one way you can refine them is to measure like, let's say that instead of measuring like the charge, you can measure the stress tensor on charged particles or something. And so it still has some um, weighting to higher or it weights higher energy particles more strongly. And this is kind of means it's more well preserved through the hadronization process. Um, because things like charge, you, you can try it. And the problem is it's just very, like it's kind of completely washed out by the hadronization process. And so I'll show kind of later how hadronization affects these. Um, and so one of the difficulties, if you want, I mean, in general, they're, they're interesting objects, but if one wants to kind of make contact with actual collider experiments, you need the hadronization process to have a minimal effect in at least some region. <laughs> and for something like charge, this is often not the case. Um, I think the naive understanding is if, you, for example, U, U by J, yeah, it yeah. has a charge to self, of course, if you enter a charge in integer, so we must put some soft Quark somewhere to make it sound. Because yeah, yeah. There's if you try measuring just like charge, so this will be essentially completely smeared out by um, there's very large fluctuations from hadronization. So even if you start with some uh, like essentially like a quark jet or something, its final charge is not very much different than like a gluon jet. And so this is essentially very poorly preserved in the hadronization process. In, in reality, though, I think uh, the experimentalists they 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 they, they define the charge to be you know, energy weighted anyways. Exactly. So then if, if, if instead of, but one can, yeah, instead of about the gen charge, but yeah. that, that's energy weighted. Usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But instead of, it seems that what's better preserved instead of energy weighted charge to do like energy where you restrict, you still do like a correlation function of the stress tensor, but restrict to like subcomponents of your theory, like either positively charged or negatively charged. And you can do correlations between like positive and negative charged um, states in your theory, um, but always phrasing it in terms of the uh, like, but always in terms of this energy option. Exactly, that seems to be evaluating it in different. Exactly, exactly, exactly. But that seems, or on different like energy on positive or energy on negative. This seems to be the way because yeah, we, we've tried with these other ones and they just seem to be like completely washed out. It's a very interesting question, but the, the way that seems to be better, uh, but it's worth exploring more, is these. Um, Annex restricted to particular um, subsets of particles. Yeah. Is that equivalent to some just energy weighting the, the charge? But no, it's a different, it's slightly different. Because um, here you're still measuring, like you can measure like a two point function, for example, of these energy flux operators, but one on like the energy flux on positive operators. So you're still acting. So in the charge case, when you energy weight the charge, you're still asking about the charge. It's just you're giving a weighting to it. Whereas here, you're, still, you're just asking about the energy on some subset of particles. Um, and that's what seems to be better behaved under hadronization. Oh. Why is that? That's all to say. Uh, 
No, it's not. It's not infrared safe, yeah. but the non-perturbative corrections are can be handled in a much nicer way. Um, so you can essentially do some kind of map mapping, or you can do some kind of matching between the perturbative energy flow detector and the non-perturbative energy flow detector. Um, and this can be handled in a much nicer way um, than for other charges. Um, yeah, so it's a very good question. Yes. Um, and so the goal of this talk will be to kind of describe some progress and understanding of these light ray operators and to kind of show that they really allow one to actually um, kind of both calculate and measure both kind of shape dependencies. So this is, and I'll explain later, this is some three point correlation function. You can actually measure um, their shapes as a function of the kind of shape of the triangle, as well as um, scale, universal scaling behavior. Um, for example, the two point correlation function um, shown here, and really kind of test properties of um, these, um, the structure of these light ray operators in uh, real world data, and actually kind of verify all the features that one wants and learn kind of very or extract from QCD kind of very interesting features, which were kind of hidden in previous ways of looking at um, jets. Um, and so just as a kind of outline, I'll see how far I actually uh, make it. So feel free to ask questions. I can just um, adjust the length as one goes on. Um, so I'm gonna first begin with the kind of most basic property, which is the kind of universal scaling behavior as these different correlation functions are brought together. And I'll explain kind of how that arises first a little bit on the theory perspective and then show that we can really measure it um, very nicely and test this um, operator product expansion structure of these light ray operators. Then I'll discuss a little bit higher point correlation functions and again show that one can directly measure them um, in data and then also why they have nice um, analytic structure when one tries to compute them um, a weak coupling and perturbation theory. And so that one can use um, advances in doing integrals uh, for amplitudes to kind of actually compute these things. Um, and then finally, I'll say a little bit, maybe at the end, about how one can use them in more complicated systems, for example, in um, heavy ion collisions and how they're modified in the quark gluon part. Okay, so the first thing one can look at is um, scaling behavior. And so if one kind of takes a step back, one can ask kind of why is this jet substructure um, limit kind of interesting from the theory perspective? And so one of the reasons is that in jet substructure, one isn't measuring these kind of correlations or detectors at kind of random angles, but one is interested in the configuration where you bring a whole bunch of these detectors together at very small angles inside a single jet. And so that's just kind of experimentally what one is interested in. Um, and it's very nice that this aligns with the fact that typically as you bring I don't know, operators or objects together in quantum field theory, you generically expect some kind of universal uh, behavior. And so this is very famous for the um, operator product expansion of local operators. So this allows one to describe, for example, um, critical phenomena. And so you get some very nice uh, scaling behavior. And this is also particularly kind of appealing, at least to me, because it's relating some very kind of macroscopic um, or kind of dirty uh, measurement with some actual very well-defined feature of the theory. So you can map some measurement to a kind of very precise macroscopic property of the theory which is something that we want to also like to do for very messy um, collider experiments. Um, and so one thing which was originally proposed in this um, paper by Hoffman and Valdesina, and then expanded on um, by these authors um, at Caltech, is that these energy flow operators, so even though there's some um, non-local or light ray operators, they actually admit an operator product expansion. And so what that means is that as you bring two of these, you can think of them in this case, um, just as calorimeter cells, as you bring two of them together, you can expand over a broader set of these um, light ray operators. And now you get a scaling behavior in the energy or the, or in the angle as you bring them together with some um, anomalous dimension, which is the twist, um, which I'll show later. And so the way I want you to think about this is almost the kind of, or the way at least I think about this, is almost kind of the opposite of the standard OPE, whereas here, instead of trying to um, create some generic state by expanding over local operators, here you're trying to detect some generic state. And so you can imagine that if you're kind of detecting generic energy fluxes, you can expand, for example, and I'll show later, over operators that um, kind of uh, 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 over more general detectors, which are not experimentally realizable, but which you can write down in theory, which for example, detect quark and gluon states, at least in QCD, uh, with different energy weightings. And so what this allows one to do is to expand complicated configurations of multiple detectors 
over um, a small subset of operators, which for the particular case of QCD, I'll show um, later, which then predicts um, the scaling behavior of a kind of wide class of these correlators as you bring the operators together. Um, and so if one can really make this um, operator product expansion a reality, for example, in QCD, um, this really allows kind of a completely different way of talking about jet substructure as just the study of the symmetry and operator product expansion structure of these operators. So instead of doing kind of um, calculating these kind of jet observables, you just study the um, operator product expansion structure of these operators, and this will tell you how you expect things to happen um, in collider experiments. Um, can, can the spectrum in that OPE be calculated using SCET? So the leading twist ones, yes. And so, yeah. And so this, what, what, <laughs> this can be done very efficiently. And so the, the ultimate thing, which I'll um, show you later, is kind of a hybrid between SCT and this operator product expansion. That essentially, because SCT allows you to calculate more general. So, so the nice thing about these, um, when you do their OPE, you're at a fixed spin. And so SCT allows you to compute for a kind of generic spin. And whereas here, you can exploit that you've reduced to a particular spin to simplify things even further than SCT. So this is kind of included in SCT, but if you choose this particular kind of class of observables as compared to some generic um, jet, it simplifies things um, greatly. And so what I'll show later is it's very efficient to first kind of perform this OPE and then use SCT to compute like the one point function of this at the LHC. And so you kind of combine that SCT prepares some highly essentially boosted quark and gluon states and then you evaluate this in those states. And so it's kind of, um, you can kind of essentially combine the two um, approaches. And that's, that's what we'll ultimately do for um, like actual LHC. Um, correlation you're interested in are still sort of uh, within the jet. The correlations are all at small angles inside a jet, yes. Um, and so that's why this will converge kind of very fast and we can do it to this leading twist in the expansion. Um, yes. And so one can ask kind of why uh, people had not done this before. So this was proposed in like 2008 was the paper. And there's this exchange in this YouTube video um, from the KATP oops, um, talk after where when this was being presented, kind of Polchinski and David Gross were asking, well, there's a huge amount of QCD data. So why haven't people uh, looked at this before? This seems like a kind of very, very basic uh, prediction, arguably the first thing you should look at is the two-point function. Um, and so why um, have people not done this? Um, and so the answer, um, which is not quite historically correct, but it supports um, the kind of talk I'm giving, is that people kind of don't do this. I don't know why. Um, they just haven't thought about this. And so then this kind of, um, this was right as the LHC or kind of before the LHC was kind of starting up. And this was then kind of um, completely forgotten. Um, and no one um, looked at it as of kind of last year. And uh, there are actually QCD people in that audience. <laughs> um, no, which is probably why there was, this wasn't fully corrected. Um, and so historically, this is not quite true. Um, so these were proposed very early on and then also abandoned. Um, but um, yeah, that, that's part of the problem. Um, yes. Yes. Um, and so I won't go through the full sociology, but I'll just give two um, kind of reasons. So the first is that around, so these energy correlators were originally proposed at almost the same time as this um, kind of thrust observable. Um, and for um, certain reasons that I don't fully understand, people kind of switched to these kind of what are called event shape observables that people have probably um, heard of. And so the goal of these observables was to kind of focus on the underlying S matrix element and to essentially project onto some particular underlying S matrix with some resolution, which essentially gives you the jet. And so these are fine, particularly if one wants to study the like angular correlations, which people were interested in in the very early days, if you wanted to see if the gluon was spin one, um, but these are not correlation functions. So they can be expressed as an infinite sum of infinite point correlation functions, but it makes them very difficult to deal with um, from a more formal perspective. And so the kind of, on the QCD side, people are mostly using these. And so there's this real kind of mismatch um, in language as opposed to what, or the kind of procedure that Maldacena and Hoffman uh, were proposing. Um, and the second thing which shows that what was said wasn't quite true is this is a measurement of these energy correlation functions uh, from a very early um, Opal um, collider shown here. And so this is the angle between the two detectors. So this is a two point uh, function. 
And so one of the difficulties is that QCD is not a conformal um, theory. Um, and so an energy scales of, for example, LEP, so there each jet has about 40-ish GeV. And so if you start looking at the internal structure, um, which is at small angles shown down here, and so this is a comparison of the actual data here to some simulation, which tries to mimic um, it being on just partons as opposed to it being with the hydronization procedure. And so you can see that it's small angles. Um, it has a huge effect, which is also just saying if your jets have three or four particles, you can't actually measure kind of multi-point correlations because it's very sensitive to the fact that the um, particles have kind of a finite mass. And so they can't just develop um, multi-point correlation functions. Um, and so these colliders, it was very hard to, or there was a big gap between what could be done from a kind of more uh, perturbative side um, and what you would actually um, observe. But of course, this very nicely changed with the LHC. So here we can have jets that are up to say a TEB instead of 40-ish um, GV, and they have order kind of 30 or many, many particles. And so if you start to measure, for example, a three-point function, you're definitely not limited by kind of the masses of the particles, and you're really in a regime where QCD is behaving even for multi-point correlation functions as a kind of weakly coupled um, CFT. And so we can start to actually use um, all these nice techniques um, that were developed to study the kind of multi-point correlations inside jets um, at the LHC. And so just as one aside, so in the kind of remaining or the remainder of the talk, I will show actual plots of these correlators on um, LHC data. And so the way that we're able to do this is because um, CMS has released some amount of data in what is, or which has been then repackaged in a form that is possible to use under what is called um, MIT open data. And so this data is not useful, for example, if you want to like search for the Higgs or something, but if you just want to look at QCD jets, which are in every event, um, it's extremely nice. Um, and so it really allows one to kind of rapidly test these um, theory ideas. And so this, it's a bit hard to read the timestamp, but I kind of asked for this at lunch and then got it later on that evening. And so you can do really fast um, analyses of trying out new techniques but then they can be done more carefully by professionals. So this is not designed to kind of replace experimentalists and these don't have error bars or anything. It's just to kind of illustrate some new um, idea and then they can be done um, measured or they are being measured um, much more precisely um, with more data by actual um, experimentalists. Okay, so now we have to understand what you'd actually see um, at the LHC. Um, so in a CFT, this light ray OBE was proven to be an actual convergent um, and rigorous expansion. Uh, but so the nice thing here is that we're already focused on the very small angle behavior. And so essentially what that means is that for phenomenological purposes, we can just restrict to the leading term um, in this operator product expansion. And so the things that appear in the leading term are what are referred to as twist two light ray operators. And so the nice thing is that in QCD, as I'll show in a second, there's only a very few of these. And so it actually makes doing the OPE process very efficient if you only care about the leading um, divergence, which is essentially what you do for, or as I'll show, for actual very small angles um, in the jets. And so all we need to do if we want to understand this scaling behavior in QCD is to understand what appears on the right-hand side um, of this equation. Um, and so this is actually something that one could do if one just kind of looked at um, Peskin and Schroeder. And so it's very well known that in QCD, the twist two operators are characterized by what is called a spin J and then a transverse spin, which I call little J, which is in um, a weak coupling can only be zero or two. And so if you look in, for example, um, Peskin and Schroeder, one has these standard um, local operators. So the local um, twist two spin J operators. And so you essentially have one for quarks with some particular number of derivatives or some particular spin, one for gluons, and then you have one gluonic operator that has a transverse spin, which you should think of as kind of the spin along the direction that it's um, moving towards you. And then, so just like how one took the um, stress energy tensor and integrated it, um, or you kind of essentially made it into a detector by moving it to infinity and integrating over time, one can similarly take these twist two spin J operators and make them into uh, detectors. And so you can loosely think of these as an object that detects a quark with some energy weighting, an object which detects a gluon with some energy weighting, and then objects which detect um, particular kind of polarized um, gluons. 
And so I'll come back to these um, polarized operators um, a bit later. But so the LHC mostly can only access kind of unpolarized or as amusingly averaged um, results. And so here, what you get is really just these um, two, one operator for quarks and one operators for gluons. And so then if you believe this library OPE, this is extremely nice because one exactly knows the anomalous dimensions of these operators. And so this will then determine the leading behavior of um, jet substructure observables upon doing this um, OPE. I thought the OPE contained Wilson lines. Are you somehow expanding them, in, which is why you have this series of covariant derivatives? Or so th this OPE does not generically contain, um, or this at low spin, there's no kind of Wilson, it's just a null integral of these objects. Um, because the Wilson lines are kind of, are very like high spin. And so this is the difference compared to like a standard, like just substrate observable or something where you have like a Sudikov um, or like a double log coming from high spin. The here, or I'll show in a second, when you do the OP of these, you just get like twist two, spin three, or like a fixed spin um, light ray operator. So they're really just like a null integral of these um, particular operators shown here. Um, and so these, these behave quite differently from like Wilson line style um, observables because you're at very, you're at low spin instead of like very high spin, um, which is why they're quite different than what other people have been like, or like thrust or example, the ones I showed earlier, those are all um, Wilson line type observables. And so they're really probably like very high spin. Um, Whereas these are very low spin. Um, um, and so now, though I won't, and this um, answers your question, uh, so I won't go through the kind of calculation or anything, but essentially what you can show is that since you only have these um, either quark or gluon twist to library operators, all you need to determine is which spin is appearing on, on this side when you OPE them. And so I can show that if you OPE two of these um, energy flow operators, you get a twist two spin three operator appearing on this side, and there's some perturbatively calculable coefficients which you can compute. And then you can kind of iteratively do the OPE. And essentially, what happens is each time you add or OPE another one of these energy flow operators, you just increase the uh, spin by one. And so, what you get is kind of a very efficient way of just OPEing some complicated structure down onto a single um, twist two spin um, J uh, operator. Okay. And so this is related to your question earlier. So again, I won't go through it in some detail, but if you really want to do this in some um, actual realistic LHC state, the way you can think about doing this is you're essentially preparing some highly boosted quark or gluon state, which is um, kind of sourcing um, your jet. And then you're essentially evaluating this um, one point function of this object in that state after doing the OPE. And so one can derive some form of factorization theorem, which essentially takes into account uh, the exact details don't matter. All the kind of complexities of the LHC in essentially preparing the highly boosted quark or gluon state in which you're evaluating the matrix element of this um, particular light ray operator. And so this is something that um, is kind of understood from the QCD side how to do. And many of the pieces have been calculated. So one can kind of um, reuse uh, these to kind of move these kind of more formal constructions to the real world um, LHC. Um, and so if you do this, so this is a plot of this two-point correlation function um, shown here as a function. So it's called RL for reasons, um, for a hadron collider reasons, but you should really think of it as just the angle between the two uh, correlators. And so this, you can see as you bring the um, correlators together, you get this very nice uh, power law behavior. And so in the little dots are the um, uh, actual measured values um, inside jets at the LHC. So these are inside fairly, very energetic, so 500 GeV jets. And this is compared to our perturbative calculations, which just as you go from this to this, you're just including more and more perturbative um, information. And so then it has associated with it some uh, error bars, but this can be done to kind of much higher uh, perturbative orders. But one of the things that is already very nice is that one doesn't have to do any kind of cleaning or anything. So this is really in terms of like pure LHC data. And the reason why one can compute this directly is again related to the kind of universality of this OPE limit, that even though you have these very complicated um, LHC collisions, that this um, kind of small angle behavior is protected from all this kind of extra garbage which is going on in the collision. 
And so this universality really allows calculations in this complicated LHC environment at quite high um, precision, which is something that was very difficult um, to do beforehand. Um, and so two point objects or correlations are something which you can calculate via kind of standard means. But the very nice thing is you can actually, uh, using this OPE, calculate the scaling behavior of much higher point uh, correlation functions, which you can't directly just compute using like a S matrix calculation. And so particularly, you can imagine some endpoint, or they call it J minus one point uh, correlation function shown here. And so at the level of, or in, um, and you can normalize it by the two point correlation function. And so at the level of the kind of quantum correlation function, as you imagine kind of boosting this or scaling this as a function of size, it will develop some anomalous dimension, which depends on the number of uh, points in the correlator. And so if you remember from doing this iterative OPE, if you have J minus one of these, you'll get um, essentially the expectation value or the scaling associated with a twist two spin J uh, operator up here. And so what this does is to really kind of probe the spectrum of these twist two light ray operators in QCD. And so you're really just measuring the kind of asymptotic energy flux, but you can see kind of the spectrum of the different light ray operators appearing in your theory. And so shown here is the kind of data again in the uh, black compared with analytic calculations for um, the ratio of the three point to the two point, the four point, the five point, et cetera. And so in the classical theory where you don't have an anomalous dimension, these would all be flat. And so this is really a probe of just the kind of anomalous uh, part of the scaling or the differences in anomalous um, dimensions. And also, so for people that are kind of familiar, it's well known that these, um, or the ready trajectories for these operators are um, convex. And so that's why these get more and more steep as you go to higher and higher points that you have larger spin and almost dimensions, which are larger. And so you really kind of see that feature um, directly in the data. And so again, this kind of gives a very nice map between kind of complicated jet measurements and kind of a precise underlying physics object that um, one is really kind of probing, just like at these kind of um, scaling behavior in critical uh, phenomena. And so it's kind of very pleasing that we can extract this from these um, jet measures. Is RL? So RL, you should think of, so it's like the size, if I take like an endpoint, it's strictly speaking the longest side, just someone can do it experimentally, but you should just think of it as like the overall size of a particular shape of correlator. And then you want to think like if I have a triangle, I just want to scale this as a function of size. So you fix some size. For doing this, or so this is a function of you can think of it as like I fix the shape, let's say, like an equilateral yeah, triangle, yeah, fix, fix the shape, shape yeah. and then you can think of it as getting bigger and smaller. And this will have some anomalous dimension associated with it as compared to the two point, um, which is what you see in these um slopes. Um, yeah, okay, and so in these plots, um, I've only shown this kind of uh perturbative region. But particularly since I mentioned earlier this relation to these colliders of left. So since these um, correlation functions are kind of probing essentially dynamics at a particular scale within the jet, one expects at some point that to, to kind of clearly see a transition from the kind of weakly coupled um, perturbative evolution where you get these nice scaling in terms of these anomalous dimensions of uh, quarks and gluons um, into kind of free um, hadrons, which just propagate out into your detector and have some. Uh, or have no interactions. And so you expect to see some kind of relatively sharp, um, just kind of cutoff at the confinement um, transition. And so if you measure this um, correlator, so before I was only showing you the kind of right of this um, plot. And so you can see here that in this, that what you actually get is a very sharp turnover. And so if you convert this to a dimensionful scale, it's exactly the scale of hadronization. And so on this side, you have this kind of, um, these um, dynamics coming from uh, quarks and gluons. And on the um, left-hand side, what this kind of purple band is, if, is if you just have like freely distributed um, hadrons, so with no interaction, so they're just uniformly distributed in the, with the Jacobian I'm using here, they have this particular shape. And so you can see it's really just kind of um, freely propagating hadrons going out with some kind of um, sharp um, transition in the middle. And so you can kind of see this hadronization um, transition um, in your detector. Um, very nicely. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, so the kind of, this is the most basic property, which is just the scaling. And so now I want to move on to um, studying the actual structure of these higher point correlation functions. 
And so, sorry, so what time is it? Just uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so, obviously, the kind of scaling behavior is the kind of most basic feature of your correlators. Um, and they probe the kind of spectrum of anomalous dimensions. But if you want to kind of start probing um, uh, more intricate features, what you want is to be able to calculate um, higher point correlation functions. And so, again, this is kind of modeled off cosmology. So, there, um, Malacena nicely computed this uh, three point function. And so, one can kind of ask why aren't people or haven't people computed higher point correlation functions of energy flux? Um, in collider experiments. Um, and so surprisingly, the only um, results that exist for these multi-point um, correlation functions for more than two points are these very impressive, um, again, from this first paper, um, strong coupling results of Hoffman and Maldacena. So these are an expansion um, about the kind of uniform or infinitely strongly coupled limit. And so, so they're kind of one plus um, some corrections, which can be computed um, via AES CFT. But this is, of course, very different than expanding about the kind of weak coupling limit, where you expect this kind of point-like um, structure. And so what we would like to do is to have an analogous calculation of this for higher point correlations functions, but now about um, weak coupling. And so the reason why we can actually do this quite nicely is because there's been a huge wealth of techniques for perturbative scattering amplitudes, um, which can be kind of repurposed to understand um, these multi-point correlation functions um, at weak coupling. And so just to understand why they're a little bit related, um, one can imagine computing one of these objects um, in perturbation theory. And so the reason why they're quite related to amplitudes is that they have some kind of kinematics which you can tune on the uh, sphere at infinity. And so if you think about what you're actually doing when you compute, for example, this three-point correlation function here, is you imagine having some um, perturbative uh, parton which splits into um, for example, in this case, three partons. And so you have some kind of amplitude squared, which describes that particular splitting, and you essentially integrate over all energies up to conservation of um, energy. And so you're integrating over the energies, but you're keeping the angles of the kinematics of the observed uh, particles fixed. And so if you take as an illustration, a simple kind of Mandelstam invariant, for this um, splitting. And so there'll always be just some, in reality, there'll be some more complicated Mandelstam variant, but they'll always kind of be of this form. What you get are integrals, which are integrals over these energy fractions with some delta function, and then some object, which is just these um, kind of quadratic polynomial in these energy fractions, where these zij's are the differences um, on the sphere between the energy correlators. Um, and so if you stare at this a little bit, you'll immediately recognize that this is very analogous to a Feynman parameter integral, or in this case, it's literally identical to a Feynman parameter integral. And so what this means is that one can actually repurpose a lot of the um, integration techniques um, for doing Feynman parameter integrals or just one loop integrals in general um, for doing these integrals. And so in particular, this one can actually be mapped directly to a Feynman parameter integral if you just recognize these um, kind of Zij's as some particular dual coordinates for, uh, for momenta. And so in a kind of picture, what you're doing is you're taking some, um, in this case, a three-point triangle integral, with some momenta k1, k2, and k3, and you can map those to these positions, which is just this kind of dual um, object shown here, which is exactly the integral you actually get for the um, energy correlator. And so in general, you can't always do this exact one-to-one -one mapping, but you get classes of integrals which are very similar to what you study um, in amplitudes. And so they have a very nice and well understood um, analytic structure. And so you can start to port over a lot of the nice techniques which have been used for um, scattering amplitudes, but at the level of squared cross sections or actual kind of physical observables, which is quite um, nice. And so for example, if you compute this um, three point correlation function in, um, n equals four. So in QCD, it's a little bit more complicated, but I'll just give the um, n equals four result here. To lowest order in perturbation theory, you get this very nice um, compact answer, which is just expressed in terms of these particular um, polylogarithmic functions. And so this is not much more complicated than like a four point function of local operators, or it's just kind of like a, um, a one loop Feynman integral essentially. And so it's expressed in terms of the same um, classes of functions, which gives kind of much hope that one can compute these either at higher perturbative orders or for higher point um, structures, 
using a variety of techniques which have been developed um, in the amplitudes world. And so again, the nice thing about this is this is directly a physical observable. And so one can just go out and directly kind of measure that expression, albeit in QCD instead of n equals four. And you can really kind of measure the shape dependence um, of these higher point correlation functions. And so this is a measurement of this three point correlation function uh, shown here. And so here what one has done is one has fixed the size within some window, and then you can plot it as a function of the uh, kind of shape of the triangle. So the particular coordinates here don't really matter. There's something which map it to um, parameters in terms of square, which is easy for experimental analyses. But this is kind of an equilateral triangle up here. This is essentially this angle uh, shown here. And this is some kind of flattened limit um, up here. Um, and this should be compared with the kind of um, analytic prediction, which is just what was shown on the last page. And so you can really, they're not overlaid here, but you can show that you get very good um, agreement. And so you can really kind of measure directly these higher point uh, perturbative correlations inside objects, which is kind of uh, very pleasing because these are nice or very nice theoretical objects um, to play with. So besides uh, pleasing, yeah. what more do you learn? Well, so I'll show you, it depends what, what you want. So I'll show for the three point. So part of the thing is here, one is just trying to understand that one can derive the, or understand their structure. And then ultimately one wants to use them in more um, exotic systems. So this is kind of the baseline QCD case. And then one would like to use them to understand properties of other objects, which you put in there in addition to um, QCD. Um, and so that's, I won't talk about as much in this talk, but either in like, how it's modified by like the quark gluon plasma, or if you want to measure properties of like the top quark or other things. Um, this is kind of just showing that one has control over the baseline and you want to add something in to show how it's modified. And so here, this is just, I'll just show some essentially pleasing properties of this, that one really understands it. And then ideally you use it to probe something. Um, how you know. different, uh, so I'm a naive question. How different is this if I just do a dumb calculation? Just do a do a three part um, calculation, or also perturbative. Just uh, I, I suppose I didn't know any of these OP. I just I just follow the QCD Lagrangian. I'm doing a, 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 a two gluon rate plus another gluon. Uh, but part of the problem is so one has so this is so I'll show this OP structure. So this is just compute. So one has to compute this in perturbation theory. Right. So the problem is before you need to define some object which. Has a three point structure. Right, but, but I have three patterns. If I have yeah. three patterns. But so the problem is one has to say, like, what property of that one is actually going to measure. And so the problem is earlier one. So if you measure like the energy correlate on this, it has a nice analytic structure. And so it enabled people to, or like us to do this calculation. So before, if you people had tried, if you try like other previous jet substructure observables, and it just wasn't possible to actually do that calculation on the three, like perturbatively in QCD. Um, 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 so, so like the one to three splitting functions, right, have existed for, I don't know, many, many years, but to actually integrate it into a kind of actual observable that you see is very, or is very difficult for other observables. Um, and yeah, but I'm just, if I just try to use that as a proxy of yours, energy correlation function three uh, three uh but that's all i mean this what one has done here oh, oh this is already the this is is really just taking the one to three splitting functions yeah. and integrating them over energy with the angles fixed yeah so and that's, so that's all that's been done here oh that that is exactly that is what has been done here it's just yeah it's a, this wasn't kind of possible before um it it should have been done in some sense much earlier um um, but now one has these kind of more powerful integration techniques and one understands how to ask the question in terms of these correlation functions. Um, I thought that the, you're, you're relying on some CFT giving you some- Here, some here power. this is not. Here, so here to have this very simple form is relying on n equals four, but this is just a perturbative calculation of the higher point structure. So the OPE allows you to study kind of limits of this. And I'll show later. So in this case, we can just do the full answer kind of brute force. Right. And then one will want to understand, or you can use this now to study the OPE structure. But this is just, instead of computing, this is like a four point function. Instead of decomposing the OPE, you just compute it first, because in this case, the OPE is less well known. And then we can see how this works. And then ideally in the future, you'd approximate it by a few terms on the OPE. Um, but this is just a full like calculation, uh, perturbative calculation. Well, 
um, um, and so just for fun, you can kind of compare this with um, what you see, for example, in some cosmological uh, three-point correlation function. Um, and so here it's really kind of enhanced um, in this um, equal or this kind of squeezed configuration, which is exactly opposite of what you expect in cosmology. And that's really because it's just dominated by this kind of pole in the propagator. So it's kind of coming from this uh, classical splitting into the jet instead of some kind of vacuum fluctuation, which is, of course, what you expect um, at the LHC. But it's largely the shape is largely dominated by. So instead of using it for like a full splitting function, you can just approximate it by some pole. And that's kind of what this um, shape is reflecting. So you can kind of understand it since these shapes have been studied in quite some detail um, for cosmological uh, correlators. It kind of meshes uh, nicely uh, with that. Well, cosmology, you don't have Lorentz variance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there any difference in the, the, the mesh? Well, what, what kind of difference does it make? Your, your, your correlator says it. Yeah, good. So, so this is just some rough analysis. So the thing that is sensitive, the main difference here is really just this kind of uh, the fact you don't have this pole in off. So you, that it's enhanced in the squeeze limit. So the Lorentz invariance is just in this case, it reflects as some kind of, I'll show in a second, is essentially this kind of scaling um, dependence of the observable. And so I'll show that at this level, it doesn't make that much of a difference. It it's it um, enforces structure under the OPE, but in terms of just the pure, the pure like perturbative calculation, um, other than the fact that it's in terms of mantle stands, it's um, for this kind of just this, if you just brute force integrate it, it doesn't change things that much. Um, um, okay. Um, and so now it comes back to your kind of question is one of the reasons why this is kind of very um, pleasing to me is that this is an actual kind of um, physical observable that you can measure, but it has all the nice kind of theoretical properties of um, an actual correlation function. And so this is very different than kind of amplitudes, which themselves are very nice, but then when you actually have to square them and integrate over the kind of cross section of the LHC are very ugly. Whereas this is an actual um, kind of physical observable where you have some kinematics that you can study different um, kinematic limits. And so I won't go into too much detail because I'm running a bit out of time, but I just want to kind of highlight one um, simple example um, that one can use a kind of standard. In this case, they're called celestial blocks. But one should just think of this as a kind of uh, conformal block or partial wave um, expansion. And so this is something which is very basic if you're using like local operators. Um, but in this case, it really allows us to use this in these um, jet substructure observables, which for this type of observable is something um, rather different. And so what it allows us to do is to essentially expand the full um, correlator, which I just gave, as uh, some coefficients with some um, conformal blocks, um, which are determined in this case by uh, Lorentz invariance. Um, and so this is where Lorentz invariance comes in. And so one can derive the complete structure of these conformal blocks uh, for generic angles on the, on the celestial sphere. Um, but it turns out that this jet substructure limit it's actually very easy and very um, kind of intuitive to understand um, what they should be. Um, and so if one thinks about, for example, this correlator in the small angle limit, what the action of the Lorentz group is doing is essentially kind of if you boost along the particular direction of your correlator, it's just kind of dilating it. Um, and then you also have kind of rotations about this direction. And so one expects that this should be decomposable into exactly the global um, 2D conformal blocks. Um, and so if you work out, so you can do this in the kind of standard way of solving some um, conformal Casimir equations for the Lorentz group, but just writing down their action on the um, celestial sphere. And so if you do that, you will find exactly, as I just said, that they are these standard um, 2D conformal blocks, which are just these um, hypergeometric functions here, which depend on the um, boost eigenvalue, which is also called this um, celestial dimension, and this um, transverse spin um, which is the kind of spin along the direction that one is looking at. And so what one can do is one can really just plot these. So these are just some particular functions, which should just be thought of as some partial waves on the detector. And so you can see that these ones over here have some non-trivial uh, transverse spin. And so they have some uh, angular uh, modulation. And so one thing which is quite neat is that this celestial block expansion actually converges um, quite rapidly. So here is a kind of a plot, so it's hard in the full um, 2D space, but one can, for example, take a kind of slice of it. Um, and this is, for example, for a gluon shown here. And so in the red, 
is, which is a bit hard to see in this one, easier to see in this one, is the full kind of calculation. And then in green is if you just put in these twist two uh, blocks, and in red, or I'm sorry, in blue, is if you just put in these twist four blocks. And so you can see that instead of computing the full thing, you can get a very good approximation if you just use the kind of first two orders um, in this twist expansion. And so this is, of course, very similar to what people do when approximating like a, or doing an OP expansion for some higher point correlation function in a CFT. Um, but here we can actually do it inside these kind of jets um, or for these jet substructures intervals. And so it gives kind of hope that one could, um, in cases where you cannot compute it analytically, really um, do some kind of either bootstrap or this type of approach and just compute, for example, the first few OPE co coefficients and approximate very complicated um, jet substructure observables in this way. Um, and so I'll, I'll just make one kind of comment with why this is also kind of nice or a, a kind of fun example of some of these operator product expansions is that because we're really doing this um, in perturbation theory, you can often actually explicitly identify the state that you're doing the OPE onto. So in a more kind of abstract, or if you're not doing it perturbatively, you just have some uh, arbitrary states. But for example, if you take this particular Feynman diagram, if you do the OPE of these two um, detectors here, it's very obvious that you're just squeezing directly onto this particular gluonic state. And so you know certain properties, for example, that it has um, transverse spin uh, two. And so if you just expand it out, you can directly kind of see the conformal blocks uh, imprinted on this. So these terms here are exp exactly the expansion of this um, particular conformal block. Um, and so this is kind of very nice from the perturbative structure. So in perturbation theory, you organize these in terms of um, polylogarithmic functions, whereas this gives a kind of completely orthogonal um, kind of organization in terms of this, um, these blocks determined by symmetry. And so there's kind of a potential for some kind of very nice um, perturbative bootstrap um, style structure if one can understand uh, this better. Um, and so I'll just kind of skip, one can play the same kind of bootstrap or crossing symmetry games. Um, but I'll just, if I have like five minutes or something, I'll just say kind of one more comment about this in the uh, core gluon plasma and then conclude. Um, and so kind of related to your um, kind of question of what can one use these for? And so one, um, if you really understand these things in QCD, then what you want to do is to kind of put them in um, some more complicated system and see, for example, how they're modified. Um, and so there's a variety of different um, kind of systems you can put them into, depending on if you want to probe like um, finite mass particles, um, which go in, or you can put them into some um, non-trivial background. And so one thing that one can do, let's say one wants to learn about um, the quark gluon plasma. And so the way that you do this is you essentially shoot some probe through the quark gluon plasma. And so what you expect is that the kind of dynamics of this, um, the medium are imprinted into the um, structure of these correlation functions um, within the jet. And because these directly pick up uh, dynamics at different scales, it's kind of a very convenient way of reading off, ideally, the internal um, structure of this um, media. And so this is the absolute most um, kind of simple thing with, which you can do with them. So ideally, you want to read off some kind of like transport coefficients or more detailed properties of the plasma. But the simplest thing you can do is just, can you detect cleanly that there is kind of a plasma? Um, and so one way of understanding this is that essentially what these correlation functions are doing is mapping out the kind of time structure of the jet. And so you can think of this as, as you're at very small angles, you're kind of very near to the like boundary of, or the asymptotic infinity. And so you can imagine just at least in perturbation theory, some kind of particle that goes along, it lives a very long time and then splits right near the boundary. And so there's essentially a mapping between the lifetime of this particle or its virtuality and the angular size of these correlation functions. And so if you're if they're very close, you're kind of very in the IR. And then as you bring the detectors apart, you're kind of probing back um, further towards the UV. And so what you expect is that as you increase this angle, you kind of detect that there's some um, ball of plasma or some change at a particular scale. And so that's what's shown kind of here, that you get this nice vacuum scaling. And then at this um, angular scale, which if you convert it to dimensional units is like 10 Fermi or something, you immediately see that you enter the plasma and you see this um, very jump or this very big jump in the behavior of the correlation functions. Um, and so then ideally what you're studying here is some kind of behavior of these correlation functions as modified 
by um, the structure of the plasma. So right. I didn't quite understand. What is yeah. this plot of? So you you have. So this is good. We're, I mean, how are you computing the energy energy correlator in the QGP? Good. So this should just be viewed as this is like some baby version of the QGP, where you can really just take like a ball that has some fixed radius. So in this case, it's put in as like ten Fermi, and you can think of like shooting some probe through that, and then measuring the energy correlators and what comes out. Um, so like the plasma isn't expanding or anything; it's like a stationary block of the plasma. How are you in practice doing that? You're uh, uh, this is just some simulation. So it's in it will be done in the experiment by. Um, you have some like hard scattering, which then comes out. Um, and so it can be done, but this is just a simulation of what would happen if you shoot like a, a cork in this case through a plasma. Yeah, I guess my question was more in practice, like the, you're talking about the energy energy correlator in a thermal state at finite chemical potential. Yes. I, that, yeah. that's, that's what you're ambition. Yeah, that's, what, that's the ambition. This is just some like very baby um, simulation, which they use, um, but that's what we would like to do, yes. Um, yeah. um, and there, what would actually like to be able to like relate it to transport, but or like more digital yeah. properties. This is just showing like at the most basic level, you can identify the scale of the system. And then like at this location, you can measure like higher point correlation functions or something to actually understand uh, the plasma. But here you're just identifying that something changes. And then ideally in the future, you'd like to interpret uh, this in terms of the actual like transport properties of the plasma. So this is like the zero the order thing that can it detect that there is something there. Is there any work on doing uh, light ray operators and even in thermal equilibrium, just at like just Euclidean field theory in one lower dimension? Yes. Yeah, so, so we're trying, and I'd be happy to chat. But essentially, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. The short answer is like yeah, no. In the literature, that does not exist uh, any such. Uh, but I think this is something which can be done, um, or this can definitely be measured, or it is being measured experimentally. Yeah, that, that part I see. Yeah. And it would then be very nice. And it's very sensitive in these simulations to uh, properties that they're interested in. And so it would be nice to um, have a better um, theoretical understanding of it. Um, this is just here. This is the most, so here this requires essentially no understanding. All you're saying is essentially by dimensional analysis, you should see the scale imprinted on the correlator. Um, and you do, and then you'd like to understand in more detail what's actually um, going on there. Um, and so I think I'm running out of time, um, but just to kind of summarize, so hopefully I convinced you that some of these very nice um, insights from formal uh, theory have really given us a bunch of tools which allow us to both kind of think about what should be measured in just substructure in a different way, and also they're very um, computationally useful um, to do calculations that we could not do before. Um, and so one of the reasons for that is the jet substructure essentially provides kind of a physical realization of this operator product expansion um, limit of light ray operators. And so because it's a kind of universal feature, it's independent of all the kind of complexities of the Hadron Collider environment. And so you can really actually port over many of the techniques from um, studies in CFT to actual real world um, collider physics. And so hopefully this will allow um, nice ways to understand the QGP or to kind of search for new physics, um, et cetera. Um, and so thank you. Do we have further questions? Brian. Can you just talk more about what SCET can compute again about that OPE? So, you know, I, Good. So, I often wondered if, if SCET would be a useful, effective field theory for understanding some of that structure, but I don't know. I never. Good. So, so one of the reasons is that SCT is kind of in some sense, so you can compute, let's say you just want to compute like the two point correlation function. At small angle. So this, you can do this in SCT quite nicely, and it's encoded in like the SCT jet function. But one of the things that's not immediately obvious in that calculation is, for example, why it's like why you get only the twist to spin three operator. And in some sense, that's because SCT doesn't like build in any of the symmetries. It's just allowing you to describe, in some sense, twist two um, for any. It's essentially also, it is also a twist expansion, but it allows you to do it for a generic spin. Um, so this is why it allows you to kind of simultaneously answer questions about like the Sudikov limit or like Wilson lines 
or um, questions like this. And so it allows you to kind of do, and it also allows you to answer questions like about the Reggie limit or about all these kind of light ray um, related systems. And so it does allow you to describe the same physics. Um, but if you, it allows you to describe kind of a generic observable in this twist expansion. But if you further look at these particular observables, which have like additional symmetries, and in this case, restrict to spin. Like, What's the symmetry that you're talking about? Um, so here, the fact that you only get like, in this case, it's essentially like the boosting along this direction that you're only sensitive to the twist two spin three, let's say. Or if you only are sensitive to particular um, like low spin operators, um, then SCT has like, then you don't need the Wilson lines. And so like SCT comes with like, as you're asking, like Wilson lines to be able to describe like large spin, et cetera. And then if you do it for this, it just, you don't need those, um, all that kind of um, stuff and you can get it out um, with this. Um, and so whether or not, so you can also compute this using SCT. Um, but it makes it very difficult. Let's say you wanted to compute like these, um, these like higher point ones. So this is something that's very hard to understand from the SCT perspective. Why, if you have like a five point function, why it's scaling is like this. And so you, the only way you do it is you kind of compute and then it would appear, if you could compute the higher point one, it would appear like this. And so there's certain things that are a little bit hidden in it. Um, and so, the thing that I think is actually kind of most nice is this kind of combination of like SCT and some insights from this light ray OPE. That it, it allows you to very nicely compute. So in this case, the state you're computing it is also very non-generic. That you're computing to some highly boosted um, quark and gluon state, and those states to kind of like prepare perturbatively. So you're not computing in a state produced by like a local operator. You're producing in some um, state which you have to prepare, and so those are very nicely described in SCT. Mm -hmm. And so they're like essentially this: what the state is is just like an SCT quark or gluon field. Um, and so I think for that, I think that's the thing that it, it prepares very nicely is essentially these highly boosted states which you can evaluate these operators in. But then what the kind of um, OPE or operator side is like: what kind of question to ask on those states? But the highly boosted state is just some the insertion of some other light ray operator. Yes, but those are the ones that involve more like Wilson lines, as you were asking. Um, so those like the state in this case, like if you have some highly boosted quark, it's like a quark attached to a Wilson line. And so you essentially have Wilson lines in the kind of um, state that you're preparing, which are all very nicely described by SCT. And then the kind of light ray and what you're kind of measuring seems to be very nicely described by um, the Malacena Hoffman, et cetera. Um, and so I think this is the like SCT prepares essentially very nice of the state, and then you can ask whatever question you want on it. And since it's preparing a generic state, you don't like it's not being projected onto any particular spin. And then in the past, people ask that like, you can ask various whatever question you want on it. But these Malacena Hoffman questions are a particular um, like project onto particular quantum numbers of that state in like spin, and so make it kind of easier in some sense to ask the question. And so I think what it's kind of the combination of the two um, that SCT prepares nicely this state of these kind of yeah Wilson lines etc. And then you use the light ray OP in that state. We had lots of questions during the talk, so maybe we uh, thank Dean again. Really interesting. Oops. Now, here. That's, that's 